Now we listen to Elisa Helms. Elisa is a sociocultural anthropologist. She's a professor at the Gender Studies Department. She's also the head of the department uh, here at CU. Uh, 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 one difference uh, between uh, uh, all of us uh, on the one hand and Elisa on the other hand can, could be obvious Elisa does not come from what used to be Yugoslavia she came to what used to be Yugoslavia and people uh, after those wars were uh, you know uh, uh, motivated by different reasons to come be it career be it money be it whatever uh, Elisa came to do research and she also I think came to help and to uh, express her compassion and her research and her book on uh, um, innocence and victimhood of Bosnian women uh, during and after the uh, war uh, is very, very important and very valuable. But I think that uh, Elisa is a model of a researcher who cares, although there is nothing that uh, uh, should, uh, should uh, force Elisa to care. We are sort of forced to care, she is not. So Elisa would be, would be uh, talking about uh, uh, gender and uh, victimhood in uh, post-war uh, Bosnia. Elisa. Nedan, thanks for <laughs> um, introducing me in this way that I, makes me think, uh, you know, about why I care about Bosnia. Really, I care because I've been, I've been living Bosnia for 20, 25 years, which started out um, with uh, two years in a refugee camp in Croatia. And that's really, it, it wasn't really my fault. They, they pulled me in and I, I was helpless. Um, helpless victim. Um, so, <laughs> right. Um, but it, it's also, it also comes from um, the nature of ethnographic research, which is, is, is the kind of research that I've been doing. Um, Okay, so I'm not a television person, I'm not a media expert, I'm, uh, but I've been asked to talk about um, the construction of, of narratives of victimhood and identity, and this is exactly what I've been doing my work on. Um, most, most of this work is really contained in this, this, this uh, book, which came out a few years ago. Um, my work has been on women's activism in post-war Bosnia, but it's really been about, um, and what I'm going to talk about today is really the, the gendering of national narratives, which really um, absolutely rely on narratives of victimhood, um, victimhood from the war and relations with uh, other um, competing nationalisms in the region. Um, so I'm coming from a position of uh, using a gendered lens, um, which does not mean at all that I only want to look at what's happening with women or um, only at this category, but I'm approaching, I use gender as a lens by, uh, through which to look at how it intersects with other categories, ethnicity, nationalism, uh, age, um, many social categories, um, including the uh, rural-urban divide, which becomes, I think, very, very, um, salient in this, in this context. Um, I'm also looking at, at so, so victimhood as a central part of these uh, national narratives about who we are um, as a nation. The feminist critiques of nationalism um, during the wartime period and just after um, really d did a very thorough job of, of deconstructing nationalist projects in Serbia and Croatia, showing how they rely on a very patriarchal um, set of assumptions about female and male roles, uh, the roles of uh, men and women. These are probably, hopefully, familiar to everyone. It's also about the way that we think about war, um, and we've already seen some examples that speak to this, um, where males are the assumed um, actors of relevance, they are the politicians, the generals, the military actors. Um, women get uh, assigned the roles of passive victims, apolitical, innocent civilians, um, and sometimes the active roles of supporters of nationalism, um, especially in terms of their roles as reproducers. So they're expected to um, produce children, for the nation 
to raise them in the culture of the nation, um, and this is the role that women are, are assigned. Um, this is not at all the way that these, uh, these things always play out, but this is a kind of dominant narrative that I think we can, can recognize, especially in the way that we think about war. Um, you can think about um, urban areas like Sarajevo, where um, women had achieved a very, um, very prominent place in paid employment. Um, we can think about the, the socialist legacy there. They're very educated, etc. War comes, and it's immediately obvious. Men have to go and fight. Women need to stay and take care of the home. Of course, if you look at what happened, um, things don't play out that way. Um, in every case, but this is the dominant narrative that I'm, I'm working off of. Um, and what I focus on are, it's difficult to talk about what exactly this is, but Bosniak dominated areas of Bosnia. And so the politics of Bosniak nationalism and the politics of Bosnian nationalism, and there's a very big overlap here. The figures of victimhood that I'm going to talk about function in a very similar way for both Bosniak and Bosnian narratives um, because they, are represent, they, they represent the, the victimhood of the collectivity, whether that's defined in ethnic ways or in multi-ethnic kind of uh, civic ways as Bosnian narratives are. Um, in other words, um, support for Bosnia-Herzegovina as a... a um, a multi-ethnic state where citizenship is based on citizenship and not ethnic uh, belonging. And as you know, this is a, a big sort of one of the biggest uh, con contestations in Bosnia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, um, in the post-war period, but especially in the Bosniak-dominated areas. And this is, I'm talking about the post-war um, demographics of territory, which is, of course, a result of ethnic cleansing um, and the war violence. And this overlap is such that it's often very difficult to tell which one is, 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 is um, being mobilized, right? And, and even the people who, who, I think, call on these um, different narratives aren't always clear which, which, one, which ones they are. Um, in part because Bosniak nationalism officially um, supports the idea of, of multi-ethnic um, society um, and rejects the separatist nationalisms of, I mean, the other that it constructs itself against are the separatist nationalisms of Serbs and Croats in, in Bosnia um, that want to create ethnically homogenous territory. Um, but what I was interested in is looking at the role of these gender assumptions um, and the way that gender is really fundamental to these narratives from the perspective of the victimized uh, national community. Um, and so what I have to say, although it's, it's critical of these narratives um, and deconstructing them, I need to emphasize that it's not at all, I don't want, I, I insist that you can be critical of this, these narratives at the same time as recognizing the, the extent of the violence and um, not in any way diminishing um, the, the severity of, of, of the atrocities. Okay, um, I talk a lot about representations um, and very much the, the Western representations especially, and I'm talking about academic analysis, activist representations as well as media representations, um, visual as well as, as textual, um, have really been mediated through this kind of orientalist, balkanist, um, set of assumptions about um, the backwardness, not completely Europeanness of the Balkans, where violence, um, war atrocities, um, especially sexual violence um, and mass rapes, have been seen as sort of evidence of the backwardness of the region. Um, but these are things that, that people in the region also call upon, and, and, and they, they shift these boundaries, they try to um, uh, construct 
well, they construct themselves very often within the positive categories and, and shift the boundaries sort of further east or, or, or south. If you know the, the concept of nesting orientalisms, then um, this is what I'm talking about. Um, but it also overlaps with uh, many other binaries like backward and modern, um, rural, urban, Balkans, European, um, and these are all gendered in, in very significant ways. I should add the, the, the political and the private or the non-political um, because this is where we see um, this gendering happening um, where uh, especially rural women, um, refugee women, the women of Srebrenica become um, the ultimate apolitical figure, distance as far as possible from um, being implicated in any sort of national process, um, military process, um, and they become the ultimate um, symbol of innocence um, in, because at the end of the day, these national narratives, narratives of victimhood are about um, their moral narratives about innocence, about um, non-implicatedness, um, which implicitly then implies that, that the other against which um, the nation is being constructed is guilty, is barbaric, is, um, has, has been the cause of, of all of the, the, the violence and, and also the other things in um, the post-war era which have caused um, suffering and um, diminished lives for, for people trying to, to put them back together, like corrupt politics um, and all of these things that come out of the war. Um, and so the, the, act of, the women activists that, I that I've been, that I was working with very often sort of position themselves um, in opposition to those, those forces and sort of say those are male forces, right? Politics, war, nationalism, um, we had nothing to do with them. Okay, so I've been told I have five minutes. Um, I want to run through the sort of dominant images to, um, of gendered victimhood to kind of make my point of, of, of the, the dynamics that I'm looking at. Um, so we know that the images of Srebrenica women, um, the, the emphasis is very often on mourning, on loss, loss of male family members. Um, they're, very, they're often depicted as they appear in everyday life. Um, with headscarves and, and rural dress. Um, this is very often, I mean, this is, this is stressed, and I'll get back to, to the importance of, of that. They are also, they are also um, portrayed in active roles, protesting, um, having meetings with high-level officials, and being very explicit about their demands and their, and their, um, their objections to the, the, the comportment of the international community, for example, the lack of justice. Um, but they're also often accused of being manipulated, manipulated by politicians. So then we assume politicians are, are that, that, that's assumed as a male realm, um, and rural women cannot possibly be associated with that, their, their, their distance from um, the realm of the political. Um, of course, we also have the image of uh, survivors of wartime rape, and here the emphasis is... is um, on shame, on reluctance to speak, on the taboos and stigma. Um, but we have to remember that the reason why wartime sexual violence has entered international jurisprudence has become a war, a war crime that um, can be prosecuted and has been prosecuted at the level of international tribunals is because Bosnian women spoke. They gave their testimonies. It's not that it was so unspeakable as, as the, so the representations are about shame and, and unspeakability, but there's another reality there that um, these women did speak out. There are, of course, images, male images of victimhood, which we've already seen in Harris's um, uh, presentation in a uh, television um, a version. Here's the same picture on the cover of Time. Um, these are of course, um, iconic images that, that stand for the victimhood of Bosniak and Bosnian um, narratives, uh, the, the narratives of victimhood in, those, in that uh, collective identity. Um, 
These are never sexualized, as far as I've seen. Even though Bosniak men and non-Serb men were victims of sexual torture um, during the war, that becomes an even more of a taboo because men are not constructed as even potential victims the way that women are. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's set up from the outset that men are there to protect women and the nation from rape violation. Um, I can also talk about the, the um, construction of, of, of national narratives through the figure of uh, female victims, especially um, in, in Bosnia itself. This is a, a cover of a book um, of testimonies of, of war rape survivors. Um, the title they cho chose, of course, it's a, it's a, qu a quote from one of the survivors, um, but it's very telling. It, it, I begged them to kill me, which is very telling in terms of the way in which they're asking us to understand the crime. It's a crime of, of moral violation um, rather than um, bodily violence and many other things that, that we can think, think through. Um, the idea that a woman who's been raped is socially um, socially dead in some, some people's uh, narratives, um, that this has been more, worse than death, actually. Um, okay, so I have to go very quickly now. Um, I've been talking about the, this, these, these um, connections that lead to um, women becoming, um, I think, more comfortable and natural symbols of this um, national victimhood. Um, because they can be seen as unimplicated, morally pure victims. They're not constructed as actors of the nation or um, of, of military actors. Um, I'm going to go quickly through this. And there is a, a reluctance. So I was, I was looking at activists, and, and there's, uh, many of them have a very um, deep critiques of patriarchal um, logic, um, which this kind of nationalist narrative is. It denies women the equal citizenship and participation in the political sphere. Um, it, it denies men the, 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 the full status of victimhood, really. Um, it pre-configures what, what we think of as the iconic victim um, and the iconic um, perpetrator or political subject. Um, but there's a real reluctance, of course, because as soon as you start to pick apart this, this um, narrative, um, you get accused of disrespecting the victims or, or uh, denying the crimes, which I insist um, are not incompatible things. Um, we can do both. Okay. Um, I don't have time to go into uh, the, 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 these different figures of um, female victimhood. One is the, the, the dominant figures are, as I've said, the, the, the survival, uh, survivor of wartime rape, um, and the other is the refugee women, especially uh, women of Srebrenica. Um, so I guess I'll just sum up um, the reasons why I really am arguing that, that um, refugee women, or the women of Srebrenica especially, because Srebrenica holds this, uh, the, this dominant position in this narrative of victimhood um, as the, the, the largest atrocity um, to happen to the Bosniak and Bosnian communities um, in the war. Um, but there's a, a certain level of, of uncomfortableness around um, rape survivors. Um, because if you take the logic of gendered nationalism to its, lo to its logical conclusion, um, the role of men is to protect their women. And so if you emphasize the fact that women were victimized, were raped, um, you can then logically conclude that, that the men has, have failed to, to do their duty. Of course, the, the, um, the facts of concentration camp detention of many men complicates that narrative very much, but that's a masculinity that is not the kind of strong uh, muscular military masculinity of a strong leader um, that is really preferred in, um, in this kind of, of gendered understanding. Um, 
And so it's not surprising that in narratives of, of, and images of Srebrenica, um, it's really stressed. So, so women become the, the prime um, face of that victimhood. They are victimized because they have lost male family members, but it ties them to those men as family members and not as military actors or potentially armed um, figures. It's, it's very important in those narratives to um, call attention away from the fact that there were, there was an army unit in Srebrenica and they were armed. And let me just be clear, the, the, the manner of their uh, execution should make that distinction irrelevant, but it's the way that we think about war and who are legitimate targets that make that really essential to emphasize the family connections of these men, the fact that, or the, the, to think of them as civilians. Um, and if we think about TV coverage of, of Srebrenica, um, some of the most iconic um, footage has been the, the scorpion tapes, which is the killing of, of children, really. Um, and there's a, the, the footage of the man who's he's calling to his son, I think. Ramo, yes. He's calling into the hills and to say, you know, come down, it's okay. Um, really, really uh, emphasizing those family ties and the, 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 the kind of simple innocence of rural people. It's the rural urban divide too that, that, that often gets emphasized in these. Um, and again, it's uh, being rural and especially female is, is the farthest away you can get from those who have any responsibility for um, for the events. Um, that's sort of the, the essence of, of these dynamics that I want to point to, and um, I think there are a lot of things that we can think through in, in terms of thinking through the, the images that, that came through on television um, that really show, I mean, I think that your army images in Serbia were really in, indicative of a particular type of militarized masculinity there that you were pointing to that's disciplined, uh, defensive, right, and we see this in all, because these are competing national narratives, and they're competing narratives of victimhood and innocence of, we, it, it was not our fault, we were acting in defense, right, and this relies on a particular form of masculinity that's useful in a particular time, but then also these particular forms of, of femininity, which, which your work also brings out, um, is, is, I don't want to say useful in a cynical way and, and get into conspiracy theories, but it, it's, it's, uh, it more comfortably fits these kind of, of associations and doesn't allow us to pick apart the kind of power hierarchies that are there in victim coll uh, collectivities that have been victimized as well as those um, who have been, who, um, in whose name crimes have been perpetrated. Um, and this works for other collectivities as well, not just the Bosniak and Bosnian. I'll stop. <laughs>